we're counting down the top five forgotten Great Lakes of North America. Immense freshwater seas that rival the famous five, yet have slipped from maps and memory. From remote northern giants to ancient prairie gateways, these lakes have shaped indigenous trade, climate, and ecology for millennia. Which hidden giant deserves its place among the continent's greatest waters? Let's start the countdown with number five. Lake Athabasca sprawls across the northern edge of Alberta and Saskatchewan, its surface stretching over 7,850 square kilometers, nearly matching Lake Ontario in size. Born from the meltwaters of ancient Lake Agassiz, Athabasca's basin still holds the memory of the Ice Age in its cold, clear depths and sprawling delta. Here, the peace, Athabasca Delta, fans out in a maze of wetlands, one of the world's largest inland deltas, and a haven for migratory birds. Whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, and countless waterfowl depend on this remote sanctuary, which was nominated for UNESCO World Heritage Status in 2021. Yet, beneath the mirror still surface, a different story unfolds. Along the northern shore, veins of uranium have drawn miners since the 1940s. Canada's uranium industry began here, and the legacy is written in the land. Tailings, piles, spill sites, and a long shadow of health concerns. In the communities of Fort Chippewyan and beyond, elders recall days when fish and water were the backbone of survival. Now, monitoring teams test for arsenic, mercury, and radioactive elements, pollutants that move from mine to river, from river to lake, and from lake to table. Community-led studies have found contaminants above legal limits in dozens of sites, and a new decade-long health study launched in 2024 aims to answer questions that have lingered for generations. Despite its scale and ecological richness, Athabasca remains largely absent from national conversations. Its remoteness, the complexity of its contamination story, and the ongoing struggle for indigenous stewardship have kept it in the margins. But for the people and wildlife who depend on its waters, Lake Athabasca is anything but forgotten. Lake Winnipegosis stretches across the heart of Manitoba, covering roughly 5,370 square kilometers. Its surface is so shallow that a strong wind can set the whole lake in motion, pushing water up onto the surrounding marshes and farmland. For generations, this vast floodplain has acted as a buffer, soaking up spring thaws and tempering the wild swings of prairie weather. In May 2011, those waters rose higher than anyone expected. Heavy rains and rapid melt sent Winnipegosis spilling over its southern shore, overtopping Highway 276. By midnight, the road had vanished beneath a surging sheet of water. Emergency teams rushed in, closing roads and stacking sandbags, while local farmers scrambled to move livestock and protect their homes. The Manitoba Emergency Measures Organization coordinated the response hour by hour, and recovery stretched on for months. Yet, even as the floodwaters receded, another problem lingered. Federal water quality monitoring had ended in 1995, leaving a gap just as climate extremes grew more common. In the absence of official data, local volunteers and researchers stepped in. They launched homemade buoy sensors and used drones to map water levels, sending real-time updates across a patchwork of marshes and farms. As one community scientist put it, we can't wait for Ottawa. Our own drones are tracking seasonal changes across the marsh flats. These grassroots networks now form the backbone of lake monitoring, blending old-fashioned resilience with new technology. Winnipegosis may be shallow, 
but its role as climate buffer and testing ground for community science makes it vital to the prairie's future. Lake Manitoba once belonged to a vast inland sea that swept across the Canadian prairies at the end of the Ice Age. As the glaciers retreated, the water shrank back, leaving behind a chain of lakes and marshes. Today, Lake Manitoba is a living link to that ancient world, a place where Cree and Ojibwa fishers, Midas traders, and settlers have cast nets for centuries. Stories of Manipogo, the lake's legendary serpent, still ripple through local logbooks and campfire tales. In 1962, an RCMP file even recorded a sighting, blending myth with the ongoing search for what lies beneath the surface. But it's what's happening above the waterline that now draws urgent attention. Lake Manitoba is one of Canada's busiest inland fisheries, with walleye and whitefish supporting local economies and food security. In 2015, commercial fishers landed over 600 metric tons of walleye, valued at nearly $3.6 million. By 2023, that catch had fallen below 300 tons, and the value dropped to less than $2 million. Whitefish tell a similar story. Annual landings, now half what they were a decade ago. Biologists point to a triple threat, shrinking water levels, recurring toxic algal blooms, and the loss of spawning habitat. Satellite images from NASA between 2016 and 2023 reveal a dramatic rise in cyanobacteria. During the drought years of 2021 and 2022, late summer blooms covered more than one third of the lake's surface. Health advisories and beach closures became common as microcystin toxins reached dangerous levels. Water levels, tracked by Environment Canada, dropped from 247.8 meters above sea level in 2018 to just over 247.1 meters in 2022, dangerously close to the lower management threshold. The lake's resilience, once shaped by glacial floods, now faces a new test, nutrient runoff and climate extremes. For the communities who depend on Lake Manitoba, the ancient gateway stands at a crossroads, its folklore and fisheries bound together by the fate of the water itself. Lake Winnipeg stretches across the heart of the continent, covering nearly 24,514 square kilometers. Its basin drains almost a million square kilometers, an expanse that gathers water from prairie, forest, Ampampapkans, and farmland across four provinces and parts of the U.S. Dozens of rivers, including the Kenpsetiem Red, Assiniboine, Saskatchewan, and Winnipeg, feed its waters. For centuries, these routes formed the backbone of indigenous trade, later becoming highways for Hudson's Bay Company fur brigades. Archival maps from the late 1700s reveal a network of canoe passages converging on the lake. Letters from Chief Trader James Sutherland detail the challenges of shifting supply lines as paddlers navigated flood and drought. Today, Indigenous canoe brigades retrace these journeys, renewing ties to land and water. Yet Lake Winnipeg's reach brings a different struggle. Each spring, runoff sweeps phosphorus from fields, towns, and cities into the lake. By the early 2000s, scientists such as Dr. David Schindler sounded the alarm. Lake Winnipeg was absorbing more phosphorus than any other large lake on the planet. Landmark studies from 2006 to 2014 confirmed the trend, linking nutrient overload to massive blooms of blue-green algae, some visible from space. 
In 2021 and 2022, shoreline advisories warned of toxins, and satellite images captured green swirls stretching for kilometers. Beaches once crowded with swimmers closed as microcystin levels spiked. Policy battles over nutrients have unfolded in legislative halls and on farm fields. Manitoba's Water Protection Act set the stage in 2006, but progress has lagged. Upgrades to Winnipeg's North End wastewater plant remain unfinished, while federal and provincial programs pour millions into research and restoration. Despite its size, larger than Lake Ontario, Lake Winnipeg remains under-recognized, its fate tied to choices made far upstream and its future still uncertain. North of Lake Superior, a vast inland sea lies hidden among volcanic cliffs and boreal forest. Lake Nipigon covers more than 4,800 square kilometers, but it's what lies beneath the surface that sets it apart. With a volume of nearly 100 cubic kilometers and a depth plunging over 165 meters, Nipigon holds almost as much water as Lake Erie. Its deep, cold basin was carved by ancient lava flows and sculpted by the last retreating glaciers, leaving behind sheer rock walls and a wilderness that feels untouched by time. Water from Nipigon doesn't linger. It surges south through the Nipigon River, pouring directly into Lake Superior, the only major lake to feed Superior in this way. Geologists call Nipigon and Superior twins, linked not just by proximity, but by the same bedrock fractures and glacial legacy. Ontario geological survey teams have mapped this continuity for decades, prompting some scientists to call Nipigon the sixth great lake. Yet, Nipigon rarely appears in national textbooks or tourist guides. Its isolation shields it from the commercial shipping lanes and urban sprawl that define the other Great Lakes. The lake's remoteness has also made it a flashpoint for debate. Copper and nickel were first discovered here in 1928, with mining booms flaring again in 1969 and 2018. Each time, the promise of new jobs collided with fears of losing the wild heart of Nipigon. Fishing guides, trappers, and wilderness advocates have argued for decades that the lake's value lies in its purity, its silence, and its role as a reservoir for Superior itself. Lake Nipigon is more than a forgotten giant. It is the only lake outside the famous five whose volume, depth, and direct connection to Superior make it a true contender for Great Lake status. On any map of North America's fresh water, Nipigon completes the picture, a lost sister waiting to be recognized. From Lake Athabasca's vast northern silence to Lake Nipigon's claim as the sixth Great Lake, this countdown has revealed just how immense and overlooked North America's forgotten inland seas truly are. Across all five entries, the pattern is clear. Each lake rivals or even surpasses the official Great Lakes in scale, ecological significance, or geological heritage. Yet they remain overshadowed by distance, politics, or simple omission from our maps. The most shocking entry, Lake Nipigon, holds as much water as Lake Erie and drains directly into Superior, yet rarely earns its due recognition. Meanwhile, Lake Winnipeg's sheer size and watershed reach stand as a silent giant, central to continental trade and environmental debates. What unites these lakes is their Ice Age origin, their ongoing role as ecological and cultural lifelines, and their invisibility in mainstream narratives. This list proves the Great Lakes story is incomplete without these five. The map didn't forget them. 
we did. Rediscovering them means seeing North America's freshwater legacy in full.